Whether you're a first time viewer or a regular viewer of our online service, we are so glad to have you with us today. We understand that being a viewer online isn't quite the same as being there in person, but we trust and believe that you will feel the presence of God right where you're at as if you're with us here in the service. Please reach out and connect with us as well. We wanna to get to know who you are and where you are from. Connect with us on our online chat. Now sit back, relax, and get ready to receive the word together with us. But again, we look at life and we think it's bliss. We think it's amazing. But then we continue this life in the journey and we begin to discover it's not all that we thought it was going to be, right? We, we begin to go through the motions. We start to put it in cruise control. And so therefore, as we begin to examine our lives, our relationships, our family, our marriage, we might say, well, it's not great, but you know, it's not bad. You know, in other words, my marriage is lukewarm. My relationship with my children is lukewarm. Well, what did God say about that? He said, I'd rather that you be hot or cold. He said, if you're lukewarm, he said, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. How come it is that God says, I'm unwilling to have a lukewarm relationship with you, but we live our life living all kinds of lukewarm relationships. Once again, whether it be for, with our spouses, our family, our children, friendships for that matter. How many times have we had friendships in our lives and that friendship did nothing but bring just heartache and hardship in my life? And all the while there's that scratching on the inside. It's like, man, I just got to kick this friendship to the curb. Well, you know, he's my friend. He's the only friend I got, you know. You'd be better off having no friends than having a friend like that, right? But nevertheless, we compromise ourselves and we allow ourselves to have lukewarm relationships. We might again look at our relationship and say, well, it's not going backwards. Well, it's not going forward either. We're just kind of existing. God doesn't want our relationships just to exist. And for that matter, if we were to examine our relationships, our marriages, our family, and put it in the context of a business, how would your business work would your business be successful would your business produce and would it be something that you would be proud of because when you think about a business business or su successful businesses have th two things in common number one successful businesses are always about serving people secondly successful businesses always produce fruit or they have positive gain right so in other words, have you ever noticed that early on in businesses, it's all about the customer. It's all about the people that build your business. I've said this for years, and those of you that have worked for General Motors, you would probably agree. There, there, there was a time where General Motors was built on the back of people, and it still is today. But then there's the corporation that gets in, and then it get, gets into the, the issue of the bottom line. How much money are we making? And therefore, it's no longer about the people. It's just how much money can we make? How much money can we make? And therefore, you sidestep the people. If it wasn't for the people, the business would not be successful, right? And so again, when you think about a, a successful business, it's about serving people. And then again, when it comes to a, a, a business, it's about creating productivity or having fruit that remains. Well, if a business is not su successful, if it's just lukewarm, if we get to the end of the year, we didn't have any forward motion. If we didn't have any backward motion, if we just are stagnant and still and in the same place of when we started, we might give it another year. But after a couple years, we're saying this ain't working. Why are we doing what we're doing? I had some friends that uh, they started a coffee shop and a, a pizza shop. And, and they, they did a phenomenal job in renovating the, 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 the little spot that they had. It looked like a little uh, up north cabin. It was very cute. They were very detail oriented. But the place did not generate enough income. So they as a family, even their children, they were working there at the place. Day in, day, day and night, putting in all kinds of hours. They were breaking even, but at the end of the day, if all you're doing is breaking even, you're not successful, right? So why are you doing what you're doing if all you're doing is breaking even? So once again, you're looking at it for there being fruit that remains or a, a, a byproduct that you gain as a result of having a su successful business. Well, when it comes to our relationships, we want to have positive gain. 
We want to have fruit that remains. Now, when I talk about the fruit, I'm not talking about the ones that are eaten up by worms that are bruised and beaten and that just like, oh, dear God. We're, yeah, there's fruit, but it's just not very good fruit. No, we're talking about fruit that is successful. Amen? And once again, God desires that we have extraordinary relationships. A business or a successful business is a business that will focus on what could be, but not only that, what could be, what should be. Often in relationships, we focus on what is or what was, or we even focus on what we don't want. Right? Let me say that again. When it comes to relationships, maybe it's the marriage Maybe it's the dating relationship. Maybe it's with your children. Rather than focusing on what God said about it or what it could be and should be, we start focusing on what was or what is or even the things that we don't want. So therefore, it becomes the talking point. You know, every time I come in here and you never do. And it's always, have you ever noticed that? I don't know if us guys talk this way, but it seems like women talk this way, or at least my wife sometimes. You always, and you never. And it's always the absolutes. And I'm like, I've done it one time in my life, but it's always. You know what I mean? I forgot one time, but it's never. You never. But again, what do we do? We focus on the things that we don't want. And if we're focusing on the things that we don't want, then you know what we're really doing? We're, ex we're exercising our faith for the things that we don't want. Because faith is always a perception of focus, right? If, if we're using our faith and trusting God, there is what could be and should be. Therefore, it's my focus. God, you said that settles it. Therefore, I believe it. But therefore, if all we're doing is focusing on what we don't want, we're really exercising faith for the things that we don't desire. Right? And therefore, again, whatever you give attention to, that's what becomes the reality. Right? Once again, if you focus on the negative things. Well, again, th I just, you know, saw the, the teenagers over here. Think back when you was a kid. You know, you got your outfit. I mean, you are looking good. You got the new outfit. You put it on. You styled your hair. Your hair looks amazing. You know, back in the 80s, you know, it was like this big. You remember what I'm talking about? You know, uh, we, we, we are looking good, man. I mean, we got it all together. But then we look in the mirror and then there's, oh my goodness, there's a, a blemish. I mean, the whole package looks amazing. But what does your focus go to? Oh my gosh, I got a blemish. Oh, oh I'm so ugly. I'm hideous. Oh, you know what I mean? Again, what does your focus become? It becomes on the little thing, but that becomes the reality. That's becoming what you see, and it becomes your conversation. You know, you get around to the girlfriends or the guy friends or whatever the kids. Oh, dear God, you know, don't look at me. I got the thing. I got this growth on the side of my face. Oh, dear God. Did she see me? Did he, did he see me? Oh, dear God. No. Uh, let me show my good side over here because, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Y'all just had perfect complexions when you were teenagers. You just can't even relate. Is that what I'm hearing? You're just kind of just looking at me funny out there. All right. So anyways, <clears throat> we said that relationships, or excuse me, uh, God desires for us to have I extraordinary relationships. We're relating it to that if it would be a business. If our relationship was a business, would our relationship or our business be successful? A business will always set goals. It will set benchmarks. But isn't it interesting how we as individuals, we tend to live relationships one day at a time. If you're going to have a successful business, you've got to be looking down the road. You've got to be setting goals. What are we going to do? How are we going to make this better? Or the things that are not producing the fruit, what are we going to do to answer that? But unfortunately, what we do is we just live one day at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. And without looking down the road, we can't invite God to be a part of our relationship. Because it takes faith to build a strong, godly relationship, does it not? And so what that means is, is that you've got to be willing to look down the road and say, God, this is your will for my life. If you're not looking down the road and exercising faith for your relationship, then all we're doing is living in the permissive will of God. And God will let you live in that permissive will. You might say, well, you know what? This is as good as it gets. 
This is all I can expect. Just living day by day. He'll let you live there and he'll bless you as much as he can. But God desires for us to use our faith in our relationships, right? How many of you want to be all that God has made you to be, right? You know, I, I don't know if you're like me. Maybe I'm just overly critical. I've said this a time and time, you know, time and time again. I don't need enemies because I can be my, woes, my, my own worst critic or my worst enemy. You know, I don't need you to uh, chew me up and spit me out because I can do a real good job of that myself. You know what I mean? So even when it comes to being a father, when it comes to being a, a son, a friend, a husband, you can just beat yourself up because of what you know you could be or should be. But once again, if I don't allow God to help me, I just continue to repeat the cycle over and over and over. But once again, it's not about making monumental changes or decisions. It's just one small tweak at a time. One small tweak at a time, and you'll find that relationships begin to turn. Right? Amen. All right. We said that a business sets goals. We need to set goals for our relationship. What do you want it to look like? A business researches successful examples and learns from the mistakes of others. Isn't it interesting how oftentimes we that find ourselves having broken relationships, difficulty in relationships, having desire for more successful relationships, what we find ourselves is constantly associating with broken people and broken relationships. So in other words, if a business will research what a, pro, a, a, a productive business, a fruitful business, a successful business, if they'll research it out and discover what mistakes they've made, then why can't we do that in our own personal life? Because once again, we just say, oh, I'm in love, praise the Lord. I mean, I, I've never had an example in my life. I don't know what a good relationship looks like. I don't know what a good marriage is. I mean, my mom and dad were just heathens. I'm just speaking generally, not my mom and dad. I mean, my mom, I, you know, they were good people. But, you know, I, I don't have anybody as an example. And so I, we just have this idea. Well, if I get in a relationship and I'm in love, it's all going to work out. Oh, praise the Lord. Listen, if you're broken and the other person is broken, what do you have? You have a broken relationship. But then, therefore, you have the opportunity to get around individuals that can be mentors, that can help you, that can be an example in your life. But that takes work, doesn't it? It's a whole lot more comfortable to hang around people that are like you. Because misery likes company. And therefore, if I'm around you, I can find things in your life that makes me feel good about me. Because <laughs> you're worse off than me, man. You know what I mean? Or... I can discover, hey, there's relationships. There's people that have been successful. I want to get around you. You know, my, my next door neighbors as uh, a kid growing up, they were entrepreneurial type people. And uh, I always had this desire for the last several years to get with him. Uh, the husband, uh, he, he passed away a few years ago, but the, the, the woman, she's still alive. And so I actually called her one day, and I, I haven't pulled the trigger on it. I said, but hey, listen, I said, I, I just want to take you to lunch. I said, would that be all right? She goes, oh, I would love that. She always calls me honey. She even called my mom and dad. She, they didn't have kids. I did her, her, her husband's funeral. She called my parents afterwards, and she said, you know, never had children, but if I was to have a son, I would want one like your son. That's the kind of, like, yes, <laughs> yes. I, 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 I said, can you put that in writing? I want to send that letter every year to mom and dad, you know. Like, you just don't know how good you had it, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but anyways, my mom and dad says, hey, listen, don't get too big, man. I'll tell you a story or two, man. <laughs> but anyways, uh, in regards to that, that those next door neighbors, they were always very entrepreneurial. And so I just, I, I told her, I said, you know, I just want to take you out to lunch. Because obviously you did some things right. You did some things wrong, I'm sure. 
but you were always successful in doing business. You didn't work for somebody. You always worked for yourself. And so, like, I just want to pick your brain. You know, what did you guys do? What was it that made Paul tick? You know, how did you work together as a team? And again, you might say, well, they may not have anything to offer. Well, maybe it's just one thing. If I can glean one thing, then I'm better off for it. But once again, you'll have to seek out people that will be models and examples in your life to become the person you want to be, right? In fact, the Bible says this, he who desires a friend, show himself friendly. You know, people come to church all the time and they'll say, you know, people are clicky in the church. You know, they just kind of get together and I just always feel like I'm the outside and never feel welcome. Well, once again, the scripture says, if you desire friends, show yourself friendly. In other words, you make the effort. You make the, 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 the decision, I'm going to be friends and I'm going to have friends, right? I remember when I was a kid, I was in fifth grade. Now, again, this is silly, I know, uh, but I was always in martial arts. And so uh, being in uh, martial arts, I always watched Bruce Lee movies and those uh, crazy, you know, Japanese kung fu movies and all that kind of thing. And uh, so there, was this, there was this little kid back in the day. He was a karate guy and his name was Ernie. I don't know, I can't remember what movies he played in. But it's a little guy. Well, in fifth grade, there was this guy named Andy. He was a Korean kid. And he always reminded me of that little, that little karate guy. And so, I remember going into the bathroom and uh, he was in there. And I said to myself, I'm like, he is going to be my best friend. I didn't know him. But there was this, I like, there was something about him. I'm like, I like him. And I said, he's going to be my best friend. Well, the first encounter that I had him with them in the bathroom, we got in a fight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but after that, we became best friends. What, what's my point? I made a determination. We're going to be friends. I like you. There's something about you. I wanna, I'm going to be friendly to you because I need you to be a relationship in my life. How many of you know that there are relationships that you'll have to seek after? Whether it be your pastor, whether it be people in your church, whether it be that of a significant other, right? How many of you know just that the enemy can send you just a pretty thing along your path or a good-looking thing? And you're like, ooh, they look good. Package looks nice. They could be dumb as a box of rocks. Or they could just, you know, have a heart that just, you know, has nothing to do with God. They just want to serve the devil and live like the devil, right? But no matter whether it looks good. Well, so therefore, then again, if you desire to have a certain thing, pursue it. Let God lead you. Exercise your faith. Is this helping anybody? I, I, again, I, I'm way off point here this morning, but again, hopefully it will help somebody. I, I remember when I went to Bible college, I said to myself, I am not going to date nobody. I'm tired of the dating game because I'd had one bad relationship after another. You know, I remember one, this, the, the, the mother said to me, well, why don't you ask my daughter out? I'm like, I don't want to ask your daughter out. She goes, well, why not? I said, because I'm looking for a church girl. She goes, well, she's a church girl. And I thought, okay, she's a church girl. <laughs> you know, she's cute. <laughs> you know? And, and so, yeah. <laughs> so you think about that. Walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it must be a duck. No, that's not the truth. So, I had a, a relationship after relationship that just was not good. And I'm like, God, I want a godly woman because I know that I'm called into ministry. So, within the first week of me being at school, I sat down at the, t the table. I had a yellow legal pad. And I start to write out. I said, God, you said that I'll have the desires of my heart. You love me, that it, that it delights you to give me the desires of my heart. So I am going to tell you what I desire in a woman. I said, you know better than I do, but I'm putting it on paper. Write the vision. Make it clear. He that reads it can run with it. And again, receive the, the end of the vision, right? Or the, the desire of the heart. So I sat there and I said, okay, God. I said, I could do blonde or brunette. That's just, you know, blue eyes, brown eyes. I'm good with that. You know, I went through and I just made my list of what I want. I said, she can be up to like 5'10". I said, I'm about 6'1". 5'10". 5'2 is the short end. I'll go there, God, you know. And I said, but most importantly, this is the top of my list. I want her to be spirit-filled. I want her to have a hunger for God. I said, I don't want a front row wife that sits there and looks pretty. I want a partner in ministry. And those things are what I need the most. 
and so just a couple weeks before I was done with graduating a Bible college I met my wife and she met all those things and she squeaked in on the the height thing I mean she just made just barely five barely five two you know what I mean she, she made it but Again, I talked to the Lord and said, God, this is what I'm desiring. This is what I'm wanting. But here's the thing. We're always looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Failing to understand that God is looking to present Mr. or Mrs. Wright to them. And I've heard this time and time again. If I could only find a wife that would help me serve God, I'd go to church. I'd be a godly man. Well, if you need a woman or a man <clears throat> to make you serve God, you've missed the whole point. Because that man or woman cannot get you to heaven. You've got to become a man or a woman that serves and follows God so that you'll be the man or woman that they're looking for. Amen? And so, once again, God has a desire for us to have extraordinary relationships. Man, I talked so long, I lost my notes. Where do they go now? All right. Praise the Lord. Are you doing okay? All right. Let's real quickly kind of bring this to a, a head. We've got a few minutes left and I'll wrap it up. All right. Let me bring to your attention, if you, if you will, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And this is the parable of the sower. But if you look at it from the context of relationships, it can be applicable. But how many of you know that when it comes to successful people, successful people are people that are, are willing to do what others are not. The, 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 the statistics show that the person that does just 3% more than everyone else will always find success. 3%. That's barely nothing. That's like getting up five minutes early. When the other people want to stay in bed, hit the snooze, right? And it says those people are the ones that will find success in their life. Being willing to do what others are not. But notice what it says this in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. So in other words, he's saying this. He says, there's a difference between them and you. You're mine. So therefore, when it comes to relationships, the world doesn't have a clue. The world apart from Jesus, the unbeliever does not know how to have successful relationships. They do not know how to have successful marriages. They do not know how to have successful families. It might look successful. They might apply principles. But again, apart from God, God is the one that designed marriage, designed the family, designed relationships, right? And so therefore, he knows how to have exceptional, extraordinary relationships, right? He said, it's, it's not for them to know. He said, but you're mine. And therefore, there's extraordinary relationships that you can have. It's a matter of what could be and should be. And that's only reserved for you. It goes on to say in verse 12, it says, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he, who, he, he, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, or taken away from him. Verse 13 says, Therefore I speak to them in a parable, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But notice what it says here. It says, they have, or what they do have, it will be taken away. They hear, but they don't hear. They don't have understanding. Why? Because you cannot understand spiritual things with a natural mind. And relationships... Especially relationships of the family. Relationships between a husband and wife. It is a spiritual union at its core. And therefore it says that those apart from God do not have the ability to discern or understand the true validity and strength and success that an extraordinary relationship can be in Him. Amen? 
It says that in regards to those, it says they'll produce fruit. But it says in verse 14, it says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in saying, Hearing you will hear and you shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should <clears throat> excuse me, understand with their hearts and turn. So that I should heal them. Notice once again. It says that the only way you'll find the success. Find healing in relationships. Is if you'll turn to him. So outside of him, it's broken people developing and having broken relationships. You might be a child of God, but you have broken relationships right now. It's just a matter of saying, God, how do I fix it? What's the first thing? It might be a huge undertaking, but God's not going to talk to you about the huge undertaking. He's going to say, here's the first step. Here's the first thing you need to do. This will begin to turn it. Can somebody say amen? Verse 16, it says this. But blessed are the eyes of those, uh, uh, for, uh, are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For as surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So therefore, again, it's what could be and what should be. People are generally desiring what God has made available. They search in all the wrong places. Come on. That's what country songs are made of. Bad decisions. Bad relationships. And really, the reason why they have such a sad song is because they're talking about lives that are built on nothing. When if they had Jesus, it would change the song. It would change the tune. It would take the wine out of their voice. Come on. Amen. Verse 18 says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Verse 19. He says, when he when hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes in and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. Notice what he says. He says, one of the things that causes God's people to not have. Now, remember, he first told him, he says, I'm talking to you because you have ears to hear and eyes to see. I've given you the ability to understand the mysteries. So now he's starting to explain some things. He says this, he says, in regards to this, he says, lack of understanding. Lack of understanding or lack of God's design can cause you to not have extraordinary relationships. Right? So that means you have to gain understanding. Like I said, so many people think, well, dear God, I'm just in love. Oh, she's pretty. Oh, he's good looking. He got some muscles. <laughs> yeah, well, watch that belly turn to mush in a few years, right? <laughs> yeah, so you're going to have to gain understanding. You're going to have to learn to see what God sees in regards to marriages. Number two, it goes on to say in verse 20, it says, But he who receives the seed on, stony, on the stony place, he says, This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Young believers are always going to be targeted by the enemy. Young relationships are always going to be targeted. Because why? They're not rooted. They're not rooted. They're just young. There's not the strength or the security in God. Now again... God desires for us to put God first. And when you do, you begin to experience the fruit and the success and the extraordinary relationship. Number three, in verse 22, it goes on to say this. It says, now you receive seed among the thorns. It is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and he becomes unfruitful. Remember, we said successful businesses, successful relationships, they produce fruit. It says they'll be unfruitful. But he says this. He says, now you are mine. And he says, when you're mine and you're in me, he says, you'll have fruit that abides. Again, we're going through this a little bit quicker. Number four, verse 23, it says this. He says, but he who receives the seed on good ground, he hears the word and understands it. And it says, it is who indeed bears good fruit or fruit and, and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. 
So God says, just make the first step. And you'll start to produce fruit. It might begin at 30%. It might be 60%. But if you keep at it, it can produce 100% success in your relationship. Remember I said that good or bad, you're always going to be heading in the direction of what you invest in. Remember the Bible says this, it's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. So in other words, if, if you've ever baked bread or something of that nature, it just takes a little bit of yeast, right? And you put it in there, what happens? It puffs up. You can take a little bit of that and you can go put it in another piece of dough. This takes a little bit of leaven and it will produce. Right? So what's God saying this morning? Just take the first step of trusting him to make some changes in your relationships. To achieve what he desires. To experience what he desires. If you'll give ear, he says, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. This next week, ask the Lord, what can I do to change my marriage, my relationships? What can I do to change my relationship with my kids? What can I do to help to shift the direction? Allow God to speak to your heart. Be willing to receive. It might be something that is uncomfortable, but I can guarantee you, it'll be something that is small. Now listen, go ahead and stand with me. How small is it? And how simple is it just to simply say, I'm sorry. It's not a big thing. But how many of we know that that can become a mountain? I've got to admit I was wrong. I've got to admit that i got to say I'm sorry. Pride will have the opportunity to rise up to where it seems like a mountain. But it's just a little thing. So allow God to direct you in the little things. Because he's wanting us to experience extraordinary relationships. Amen. Let's bow our head and we'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every single person that is here. Wherever we find ourselves, God, whether we're single, married, widowed, divorced, whether we have a desire to have a relationship or no desire at all, God, may you begin to help us reach new heights in the relationships that you've given us. And yeah, it might even be taking a step back and addressing some things of the past to help us move forward into the future. But God will allow you to lead us and direct us and take one baby step at a time. And we'll experience and be fulfilled in our extraordinary relationships that you've designed. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Now with everybody's head still bowed, eyes closed. I just want to give you an opportunity to experience or have an extraordinary relationship with Jesus. If you're here in this place and you say, I don't know him. I don't have a relationship with him. Or I think I might have. Or maybe it was a long time ago. And you're saying, I want my life to be all that God designed it to be. And I want it to be built on a relationship with Him. So if you're here and you say, I want to know that I've got a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to give you an invitation. On the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I won't ask you to come forward. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. I just want you to acknowledge my invitation so that I can pray with you and I can see you lift your hand. If you're in this place and you say, I want an extraordinary relationship with Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. You're here in this place and you say, I want an extraordinary. I see that hand. I see that hand. 
Anybody else? You can put them down once you put them up. I see that hand. Thank you. Now, again, you might say, I'm already saved. I've got Jesus, but I, I want it to be better. I want it to be all that it can be. If that's you raising your hand, praise the Lord. I see that hand. Yes. I see that hand. Yeah. Let's pray this together. If you wish you would have raised your hand, you pray it right along with us. But as a church congregation, let's pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. That you desired a relationship with me. So you sent Jesus to pay for my sins. I believe that he hung on a cross, died in my place, rose on the third day, and he desires to have a relationship with me. So, Father, thank you for forgiving my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I surrender my life. Thank you for an extraordinary relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. We're so grateful that you've been a part of our online audience. Hey, listen, if this is the first time that you've tuned in or maybe you've been watching for uh, a good season, we again just thank you for being a part of our online family and uh, helping us do what God's called us to do. God has told us that we are to change the landscape of our community and our world. And so I want to present or give you an invitation to be a part of this ministry, to help us continue sharing the message of God's love, to help us make this programming even better. And so if you would like to be a partner with us to give into this ministry, we just again invite you to be a part of that process. You'll notice on the screen that there are links in which you can uh, support or give, or you can go to gbchurch.tv forward slash give. And once again, thank you for being a part of our church family. And thank you in advance for any donation and any gift. God bless. Hey, thanks for watching. We hope you have found inspiration and encouragement in the discussion today and invite you to join us next week. You can connect with us and say hi anytime all through our social media sites and online at gvchurch.tv. We are Genesee Valley Church, loving God, loving people, and loving life.